This ritual has been passed down throughout the centuries and originates from the British Isles during the Middle Ages, where it was viewed as devil worship by Puritans and a way to protect your home by those who knew that what was really standing in their fields was not the devil. If completed successfully, the ritual will ensure you one year of safety physically, fiscal, and or mental depending on the events during the ritual. You will need a house in the countryside, preferably with a field of crops out back. Technically, all that's required is a large backyard. The larger, the better. But success has only come from houses in the countryside. A candle. Attempting to use a flashlight, cell phone, or any other electronic source of light will be unsuccessful, causing the light source to flicker and die after only a few seconds, which is why either a candle, an oil lamp, or any sort of non-electrical illumination is recommended. A crucifix, I'll explain why later, a watch or clock to carry around with you, again cell phones will not work during the ritual. To begin the ritual, make sure it is late enough for no one around to be outside, and make sure that the sun has set. The being the ritual is based around will not appear if any other than the summoner is around to detect its presence. The earliest successful summon was at 9 o'clock. Light your candle. Go out into your yard and whisper seven times, but who will scare the crows away? while facing the house. On the seventh whisper, you should hear from behind you, that's not your biggest problem. Walk back to the house without looking back. As soon as you reach the house, get inside and close the door. Now, the ritual begins. Everything in your house that can open, has. Take your crucifix into a room with only one door. Close the door and leave it there. That will be your safe room in the case the ritual goes wrong. Make sure all the doors, cupboards, cabinets, and whatever else that can open is closed in there. If he gets into your safe room, you are doomed. Your goal is to close everything that is opened before your watch reaches midnight. This sounds easy in description, but think about it. Every bag, every door, every window, every container in your house has just opened. The challenge isn't closing them all, it's remembering them all. As you make your way through your darkened house, you'll notice that, out of the corner of your eye, you will be able to see a man, dressed in simple farmer's clothes. His skin is ash grey. Don't look at him, and whatever you do, don't look directly into his eyes. But don't be afraid of him. This is not the man in the fields. He is merely a herald, a referee of sorts, to make sure that you're closing every container. He will be following you but will not get in your way. Make sure to not look out into your backyard. If you do, you will notice that there is a scarecrow that wasn't there. Its head is a cow skull, and its limbs are impossibly long versions of a human being's arms and legs. While the skin on its arms and legs is pale, they are not skeletal. The only thing that is missing is a head. If you fail the ritual, or do not reach your safe room in time, he will take yours. The reason I was telling you not to look out at the backyard, is that you will notice this scarecrow. And he, also will notice you. He will then begin to get off his post. This, is the man in the fields. If you don't look at the backyard, don't see the post and the scarecrow, you will have until midnight to complete the ritual. If you are 100% sure that everything in your house that can open has closed, 
make your way to your bed and go to sleep. For exactly one year, you will have complete and total safety in everything you do, depending on when you start the ritual. If you start it three hours from midnight, you will only be completely physically safe. A lot of people have used this to elongate their lives past where they would normally end. People like cancer patients and the elderly. If you started two hours from midnight, you will not only be physically safe, but financially safe for a year. You could quit your job and still never have a need for money. Either you win the lottery or people just feel compelled to give you things for free. However, you will need to set up a plan for the end of the year, as your safety will wear off then and you will lose all the money you have won. Make sure to either set up a business or make some smart investments. If you started the ritual one hour from midnight and somehow managed to finish it, highly unlikely, you will be completely and totally safe for one year. None of your actions will ever have any negative consequences. I tell you not to do anything immoral, but if you're going to go through your entire house in one hour and somehow manage to close all the boxes, doors, windows, cupboards, bags, cabinets and drawers, then you can do whatever the hell you want. If you did look out at the backyard, if you saw the man in the field, you will not get any of this. Not even if you finish the ritual. If you looked out at the backyard, the man in the field will get down off his scarecrow post. He will look at you. He will begin sprinting. You have a minute at most to get to your safe room. Run inside and lock it tight and double check to see if everything is closed inside. You do not want him getting in. You will have to endure him scratching and clawing at the door, shrieking threats and promises of mercy if you open the door. Whatever he says or does, do not open the door. There is no circumstance in which you should leave your safe room to confront the man in the fields. Good luck and stay safe. Kokori-san is the most famous scary game in Japan. It is similar to the Ouija board and is mostly played by Japanese school children who want to summon a spirit so they can ask questions about the future. Kokori-san is Japan's answer to the Ouija board and it has been played in schoolrooms across the country for years. The game became so widespread in Japan that it sparked several hysterias in the media and many schools officially ban students from playing Kokori-san. Using a Ouija board can be dangerous because it can accidentally summon demons or open people up to the possibility of being possessed. Kokori-san is much less dangerous since the spirit who is summoned is a trickster spirit from the Shinto religion. Kokori-san is the name of the spirit who is being summoned during the game and provides the answers. It is an animal spirit that is a mixture between fox, a dog, and a raccoon. Kok equals Kitsune, or fox. Ku is an inu, or dog. And Ri is Tanuki, the raccoon. The fox can either be a trickster or a teacher. The dog is loyal and protecting. And the raccoon is full of mischief, but also a bringer of good luck. All of these qualities are combined in Kokori-san. Young people ask many questions like, Kokori-san, who loves me? Or, Kokori-san, will I become rich and famous? But just remember that there are some questions you are better off not knowing the answer to. To play Kokori-san, you need at least two people, a sheet of paper, a pen, and a coin. Take a blank sheet of paper and draw a tori, a traditional Japanese gate, at the top in red ink. 
write yes and no on either side of the toddy. Beneath this, write one row of numbers, from 0 to 9, and three rows of letters, from A to Z. Open a window or a door so that Kokori-san will be able to enter the room. The tori represents the gateway to a Shinto shrine, and the spirit will enter and exit through it. Place a coin on the red tori. Each person should put their index finger on the coin. Call the spirit by saying, Kokori-san, Kokori-san, if you're here, please move this coin. You can ask Kokori-san whatever questions you like. It will move the coin to spell out the answer. To end the game, you must ask Kokori-san to leave by saying, Kokori-san, Kokori-san, please return home. The coin will move to yes, and then come to a rest on the red tori. When you are certain Kokori-san is left, you must destroy the paper. Either tear it to pieces or burn it. You must also spend the coin you used before the end of the day. And a final warning, Kokori-san is not dangerous and it is a much safer alternative to the Ouija board. However, we still don't recommend that you play it. Many people can become upset and depressed if they receive answers they do not like. Also, always remember that Kokori-san is a trickster spirit and can easily lie to you. The following is something I made up, but by listening to this, you have made it real. It is best to prepare beforehand so that way, everything can be on time. Timing is very important in this game. You will need a dark room with or without windows. Windows if you want safety. If you have windows, there must be curtains or sheets on them. No light can be seen. There may be furniture in the room, but not much. The floor should be clean. I don't recommend having anything hanging on the walls, they might fall down, depending on how the game goes. There should be some sort of seating arrangement for at least 3 people, or no more than 5 people. This includes a circle of chairs, or a couch. I recommend the chairs if you do not wish to share a seat. The room is ready. I recommend memorising the way to your seat. You will not want to bump into anything on your way there. I also recommend having your game room on the same floor as your bedroom. Go to bed at 8 that night. You will want to sleep. It is imperative that you sleep for a duration of time, no matter how short. Leave your room at 11.50. Put a blindfold on your eyes before you leave. Walk to your seat. Do not be alarmed. Nobody will block you. Sit in your chair. When you feel that 10 minutes has passed, you will know because it will have felt like 20 minutes, invite them in. If it happens that you do not want to go through with the game, then go back to your bed without taking off your blindfold. If you wait longer than 10 minutes, they will be offended and enter anyway. Do not let them enter on their own accord. If you take off your blindfold, it is a signal of fear. They like your fear. You do not want them to like your fear. If it happens that you want to play, say calmly but firmly. Come in and be obedient. They will come in. They are your guests. They are yours to entertain, so be polite. Be mindful of your manners and do not remove your blindfold. You do not want to see them. Be very specific of what you want them to do. They will do exactly what you do and do not tell them to. Before anything else, tell them your rules. You are their host and they will not disobey you. 
Be specific. Tell them how you expect them to act. Tell them if they are or are not allowed to touch you. Tell them what they can and cannot touch in the room. Tell them where they can go. They are like children. Instruct them with precision. You may tell them to sit. They will sit. You will know when they are seated. You may ask them questions. They may lie to you. You will not know when they are lying. You may ask them to knock on the walls. They will knock. You will hear them knocking, as well as anyone else in the house. The other person may wake up from the knocking, if he or she does. Pray that whatever pain comes to you will be swift. You may ask them of your future. They will not know. They will not tell you. You may do anything, but you must not cross their lines. You will know when you are crossing their lines. If you wish to ask them something, and you feel even the slightest hint of something wrong, do not ask it and do not mention it. The moment you cross their lines, you are dead. Remember to never take off your blindfold. They will ask you to. They will beg you to. They will try to force you with the sweetest tongues and the harshest tones. No matter what, do not take off your blindfold. And above all else, do not be harsh with them. You are their host. They are your guests. You must never be unkindly to them. They will see it as a threat and take care of you as seen fit. When you are done with them, tell them to leave and not return unless you invite them to do so. Tell them that you enjoyed their time. They love your flattery. You will know when they are gone. Do not take off your blindfold. When they are gone, walk back to your room and go to bed. Do not take off your blindfold. Sleep. You will dream of nothing bad. You may take off your blindfold when you wake, so long as it's daytime. For the rest of your life, they will follow you, but they will never be in plain sight, and they will never be there when you look at them. They will always want another chance to meet you. Do not exceed three meetings. After the third meeting, they may invite you. You cannot decline their invitation. There are stories about a certain kind of hitchhiker. They only ever appear at night and on quiet roads, seeming to flicker into existence in the very edge of headlights, never carrying a sign, always with an expression of deep despondency on their faces, swathed in a heavy coat and long pants, usually with gloves. If you stop, they will seem cordial enough, polite, but hardly chatty. They will assure you that the next town or city along your route will be a fine spot to leave them, normal enough, unless you try killing them. They die easily enough, but look underneath their clothes and you will see that their skin is marred with lines of scars, forming repeating patterns that are unsettling to look at and even more unsettling in the context of their skin. They have no wallets, no identification. If you slice their belly open, however, they're different inside. There's no blood, no muscle, only a hollow cavity containing a single object. The object varies. Examples include a single coin, heavy and golden, and engraved with runes nobody could ever decipher. A diamond gem with fractal edges that slice bare flesh to ribbons. A small vase, quite unbreakable, that smells of the ocean and is always damp. Once you possess a hitchhiker's object, you will find yourself always driving the quiet roads at night. You'll never mean to, 
but somehow you just will. The lure of possessing a single one will hum quietly in your head. You'll strain to catch sight of a figure appearing in your headlights. Try to resist the impulse to stop, and sometimes you might, but sometimes you won't. You try telling yourself that this is just a normal person on an adventure, someone who ran out of petrol. The logical part of your brain will scream at what you're doing. You'll smile and nod, and they'll get into the car, and you'll slowly, casually, reach under your seat, in your pocket, or across to the glove box.